one's got cancelled. Can't see another episode of the 20s toolkit. Yeah, yeah, wicked. Let's just uh, keep moving, hurry up. So the 20s toolkit is a series on my channel where I talk about the things that I learned in my 20s and the things that maybe you might want to think about while you're in your 20s. Now for me marriage had to be an episode in this series just because I really strongly believe that you need to know what you think about marriage when you're in your 20s or at least you know what your questions are. The other thing that you might be thinking is Lena why are you covering marriage? for a 20s series. Your 30s are for getting married. Well, maybe for you. <laughs> my best mate from down the road got pregnant when we were 15 and pretty much all of my friends uh, kind of were married by the age of about 23 and definitely on the baby train. Uh, me, myself, I was actually engaged at <laughs> 22 but I, I did back out of the wedding which is an entirely different story for an entirely <laughs> different day. So I think it's best that we have this chat sooner rather than later. Here are some assumptions I had about marriage in my 20s, lies if you will, and here are some thoughts for you to have a little think about weddings and marriage because it's confusing as fuck. <laughs> Marriages are like ancient romantic love themed ceremonies. So yep, unions between people have been going on for like thousands of years. But not really specifically between men and women. Not really between just two people and definitely not specifically for love. If anything, they were more honour themed, property themed, status themed events. Comparing marriages of the past with your average cake topping Western British marriage is kind of like comparing a pteranodon with a nut hatch. Yeah, there's a vague origin story there, but they're not really the same thing. If you want my two cents, I think it's probably best not to get too precious about protecting the history of marriage, since even around the world it's been pretty different and in most cases not that ideal. Also, some customs that you might associate with marriage ceremonies, A, aren't that old and B, aren't that deep. For example, diamond rings and weddings only became some kind of expectation after the 1947 campaign by De Beers. Diamonds are forever. Are forever, are forever. Before that, only 10% of engagement rings included a diamond. Oh, and white wedding dresses? Yeah, that was a uh, Queen Victoria. She wore it at her wedding. And after that very recent date, everybody wanted to copy it. Mm. Now there are people I do want to draw inspiration from and copy, but I'm not sure if it's a colonial perpetually miserable monarch or a ball busting exploitative rock business. <laughs> now I'm not saying that having diamonds or white at your wedding is intrinsically wrong. It's just that I'd call them more trends than traditions. And I think knowing stuff like that is a really helpful way of being able to remove yourself from the necessity to follow them. If you want that at your wedding, go ham. It's just important to not make a big deal out of it if other people don't want that, if it's simply a trend. I think we're really encouraged to picture the generations of women before us who did this beautiful symbolic thing that we can be part of, when in reality anybody past your nan probably just threw on her favourite thing and didn't even get a ring. If we are going to do traditions, personally I would love to see more localised traditions, to not see so many similar weddings, to really bring out family or regional based customs that really mean Mean something to the people getting married. Marriage is a step in building the perfect relationship. I really feel like the reality of it is that you're marrying the person they are now. You're agreeing to the relationship that you have now. There is this harrowing song in Guys and Dolls the Musical that actually got cut from the film adaptation, I wonder why. Marry the man today rather than sigh in sorrow. Marry the man today and change his ways tomorrow. Shouldn't have to explain why that's toxic and we don't have time here but it does make me shudder to think of all the marriages happening up and down the country right now where people are marrying the person they wish their partner was or who they think they have the potential to be rather the person they really are and are showing themselves to be. It's not really fair on either party and it's kind of cruel to marry somebody wishing that they were somebody else. Take thee Rachel. When you get married, you're kind of not only saying the part in the vows that's like, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, you're also saying, in stagnation, in inaction, inconsistency, just 
I'll see you all. Now this one is aimed at me. Not marrying makes me really rad and different. Very cool, way to go. Tom Rasmussen is a non-binary working class writer who's really helped me tune my own ideas about marriage. In their book, First Comes Love, they talk about realizing that they had spent years attending weddings as the wild non-conformist who doesn't adhere to gender stereotypes, capitalism, and performative love that weddings sometimes do have in the air. But as they describe, exhausted, broke, and serotonin deficient, they also also began to realize that willfully making abnormal choices doesn't make you not normal. And as glittering and wondrous as those years were, they screamed of performativity, the same way my friend's weddings did. All this time I was leaning into another expectation. The way they talked about performative wildness really reminded me that nobody is exempt from exaggeration and pretense. And it's only really the people involved who know whether what they're doing is based on something truly real. To think we're better than others for not marrying is a really dangerous road and it's up to each person to assess what they stand to lose and what they stand to gain from getting married. You have to have a wedding to have a marriage. Okay, we need to divorce uh, these two things. And to do that, we're gonna need to talk money. An average wedding in the UK costs 31,974. Pounds. I think I speak for everyone when I say JFC. <laughs> Which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if you have it. But to me, money in my head, and probably quite literally, is still hours I've spent working, i.e. effort. So if 90% of the effort and resources are being pulled into a relationship at the very beginning and not drip fed in, well, that is a really wild business plan you've got going on there. Maybe it's a coincidence or the divine mystery of numbers, but 30,000 pounds is actually dead on, on average, what you'd need for a down payment on a house in the UK. And unless you're born into wealth or you live in a really cheap part of the country and happen to have a really great job in that very cheap part of the country, it's reasonable to expect that you won't be able to have both. There is a really fun Netflix series based on this theory called Mortgage or Marriage and if you have some time to set fire to, I would highly recommend it. £31,974 is also the price of 639 marriage counselling sessions, 53 holidays away together, and if you're on the living wage, perhaps around 3,365 hours or 140 days, you could take off work. <laughs> to rest yourself or be with that person that you're with. Sheesh. And if you think about the amount of divorces that's like not spending enough time together, growing apart as reasons the marriage is breaking down, time actually becomes quite important in this discussion. So I'm not saying don't get 160 guests some gold dipped pulled pork for the reception, but like, However, it is bang out of order to take that too far and just blame the rise in wedding spending on people with ideas above their station or people being too indulgent or showing off. As always, it's never really an individual problem. It's more of a systemic issue with expectations and customs and our human drive to fight back the rise of inequality or something. I'd also hazard to guess to say that the cost of weddings has risen since industrialization and the move to cities. Like people need to leave their hometowns for work often, meaning that your communities and inner circles are less likely to be geographically close or cross-generational, meaning that it's way less possible for you to just pop over the road, rent your local church hall for 50 quid and get everyone to bring a plate. The depletion of access to things like public spaces and the commercialization of things like barns, farms, warehouse spaces means that the tooth marks of capitalism are all over the spreadsheets of wedding planners everywhere. <sighs> Bottom line is, the standard of weddings right now is completely unattainable for your average Josephine. And if people feel pressure to get into debt to create a day that bears no real resemblance to their actual lives, well, that's a real big fucking problem. It's not anybody in particular's problem, but we all contribute towards a culture that applauds the displays of wealth rather than personal decisions. No one should feel the need to spend all of their resources or their accumulated effort, whatever that means, all on one day. It's good to keep in check not only our own hypothetical weddings, but our feelings about the weddings around us. Classism, entitlement, capitalist snobbery can rear its ugly head in the most unlikely of places, mainly 
ourselves. A good example of this might be getting the hump when we're not invited to a wedding that we believe we should have been invited to, even though being a wedding guest is a massive privilege and not a right. And at the least, like a price per head of a wedding guest can be around a hundred quid, which I could pay for if I had a penny for every time somebody else has complained to me about why they're not invited to a wedding. Or I myself have felt a little bit of stroppy Angelica resentment. No more, no more. Eco-friendly weddings are a new thing. <laughs> At the moment, weddings in the UK produce 4,910 tonnes of single-use plastic every year, which is the equivalent of about 47 blue whales. But like most customs in late-stage capitalism, they're sold to us as traditions. Oh my god, so heritage. Even though a wasteful wedding is actually a very new species. Apart from the very obvious observation that about two or three generations ago, almost everybody in Britain was either working class or living in abject poverty. I think that even the middle classes of yesteryear might have balked at what a middle class wedding looks like today. When researching, I thoroughly enjoyed stumbling upon this story of Eileen Stone, who married this RAF hunk in 1945 and used his parachute to make her wedding dress. And I quote, after the wedding, she cut up the dress, dyed it brown and used it to line a coat. She kept a piece of the undyed silk to make an embroidery handkerchief. She also dyed pieces of the parachute cord and used it to bind a wedding album she'd made. And then the other pieces of cord were kept and used regularly for family camping trips. Heath Robinson was a woman. <laughs> As with a lot of things, practices that have been commonplace in working class and poor communities for generations are now being coded as morally good choices rather than simple necessities. And even if you are now in a position to afford these kinds of things, there's a different kind of necessity knocking on the door, isn't there? It's the climate crisis. Hello, will you let me in? Please don't. In my opinion, it's an ecological necessity, not a financial one now. I'm not a fan of micro shaming individual choices. And obviously big business has a lot more to answer for. But what I am saying is you don't have to be a hippie to have an eco-conscious wedding. And I wouldn't even call them eco-conscious at this point. I'd just call them reality conscious. So if your heart is set on having a traditional wedding or your family is nagging for one, remember to remind them that being plastic free is a pretty traditional choice. Marriage is an agreement between me and my partner. <sighs> it's also one of the biggest legal contracts you will ever sign in your entire life. I've said this before, but something that makes me very wary of marriage contracts, at least in the country that I live in, is that it's not really a contract between you and your partner. If it was, your partner would be able to release you from it at any time, which they can't. We'll get to that. They would also be able to determine the terms of the contract or have the power over how those things change. They don't. An extreme example of this is that in the UK, rape was legal within a marriage until 1991, in my lifetime. Now there's no danger of that coming back imminently. So says everyone who lives in a seemingly peaceful democracy before all dictatorships take over, but maybe it's an extreme example. But if I get married, I plan to be married for like 50 to 70 years plus, and things can amp up quite differently as your life changes. As far as I can tell, there is nothing to prohibit governments in future bringing back laws like it that negate basic human rights of people within marriages that are afforded to people who are outside of them. Not to say that people outside of them won't also be treated like shit in a dictatorship. And it's not necessarily a reason to sack off marriage. If a government doesn't care about your welfare, being unmarried, I imagine, doesn't afford you too much protection. But these kind of thoughts are worth considering if you feel you are the marrying type and your partner is a little bit more hesitant. Patience is appreciated. Remember, you're not just asking them to get into a contract with you. You're also asking them to make a deal with them. And that takes... <laughs> Optimism. If it doesn't work out, you can just get divorced. Oh, I get, I got me again. If only it were that simple. I think a lot of perceptions of divorces come from celebrity weddings and then subsequent divorces, where stars seem to hop in 
and hop out wherever their personal choice leads. But uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I'm gonna come in with the numbers again. The average divorce in the UK costs £14,561. And since you have a 42% chance of being in one, you better factor that into your calculations. It also takes a uh, longer than you might think. There's a misconception that if you both consent to a divorce, then it's like a done deal. But we only just got no fault divorce in the UK in June, 2021. June 2021. June 2021. June 2021. June 2021. Before that, unlike the US and a few other places, if both of you want out imminently, one of you had to blame the other on the grounds of adultery, unreasonable behavior, such as violence or verbal abuse or desertion, even if it was amicable to begin with. If you want out, one of you is gonna have to make something up. Otherwise you're waiting between two and five years to split your assets, which leaves you results in either you having to live with the partner you want to not be with for at least two to five years, or you having enough liquid assets for one of you to be able to move out and live elsewhere. It's very stressful, especially for childs involved, and it results in a lot of messy, painful divorces that could, in theory, have been very straightforward, compassionate, and not inflicted lasting emotional damage on both partners and children involved. It also meant that if you wanted to divorce your partner and they weren't having it, for whatever toxic reason, you have to stay married to them for five years. Mmm, consent. So all hail the divorce, dissolution and separation bill. Yay! But you know, the government giveth, the government taketh away. I think there is some kind of logical argument to making divorces in some way hard. If it isn't a short process, that can allow both parties to think through the decision and leave a bit of a stopgap for reflection and make sure the separation isn't just like a passing flash. This video outlines some really good points around delayed gratification and that marriage can protect us from impulses that could be against our own will or willingly harming ourselves by pushing those close to us away too lightly. But putting a huge price tag on it doesn't just make it go slower. It completely relegates a lot of people from the right to it at all. You only gain rights when you get married. You don't lose any. As I said before, marriage does make me nervous because you're not just tying yourself to your spouse, you're also tying yourself to your government. Along with the rape clause I mentioned, plus the scenes in The Handmaid's Tale where they turn off their credit cards comes to mind. And then they transfer people's bank accounts to their partners. And the real life reality that in the past and still today in some countries, if you have a husband, you couldn't get your tubes tied without his consent. Having said all that, perhaps I'm being paranoid. After all, human rights and marriage have a history as intertwined as peanut butter and jam. An example of this, <laughs> I'm not trying to scare you, I promise. We're gonna get some happy stuff soon. An example of this is that if you're married, you lose the right to control your own will, even if your bank accounts are completely separate. In the US, you cannot disinherit your spouse, even if it's just innocently that you want to leave your money directly to your children because of something called the spouse's elective share. In the UK, you can, but a spouse can still change the terms of your will after you die. I know. Also, in some countries, you automatically take on the debt and the credit score of your spouse. In the UK, you don't. However, if you get a mortgage with that person later down the line, if you individually want to apply for credit, they will look at your partner's credit history and then potentially decline you if it's really bad. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the human right to get married at all, which historically in the UK hasn't been given if you are A, working class, B, not white, or C, not cis, or heterosexual. Some of the many examples of this I could give are old, new, borrowed, blue. For instance, in 17th century Britain, laboring class citizens were forcibly prevented from marrying whilst over the pond, enslaved people were being denied the same. Then in 1753, when the law seriously started getting involved in marriage, even more restrictions started waltzing in uninvited. Among other things, it required all legal marriages to take place in an Anglican church. Quakers, Jews and royalty were exempt, but all the other religions, including Catholicism, weren't, which among other things meant directly screwing over all of the Irish citizens, basically ruling all of their marriages illegal and any children born under them illegitimate. 
Brilliant. In the early part of the 20th century in Britain, we had official government guidance that advised British women from marrying Chinese, Hindu, Muslim, or black men. You already know this, but same-sex marriage is still only legal in 23 countries. Fun fact, polyamorous marriages are legal in 63. And most local to me, Northern Ireland only legalized same-sex marriage in 2020. 2020. Even now with some equal marriage laws being passed, a lot of people are being left by the wayside. For example, if a trans woman wants to get married but hasn't gone through the process of self-identification, they would have to go through the marriage process as their sex assigned at birth. But if that same woman then went to change their birth certificate legally, their marriage would be automatically annulled. Riddle me that. Riddle me that. Also, did you know that in the UK, your marriage can be voided or annulled if you have an STD, or if you are trans, or if you're pregnant with somebody else's child. But in conclusion, this is a weird ass country. Plus, if you're living with a disability that requires financial support, or you receive benefits like universal credit, pension credit, housing benefit, or council tax, getting married can reduce your financial autonomy because your partner's income is automatically taken into account as soon as you marry. Or even sometimes if you just live together. I'll leave the links if you wanna learn more about that below. But in short, it sucks if people are having to choose between healthcare and a roof over their head versus marrying the person that they love. Something has gone seriously wrong. in a marriage with a man. You have nothing to worry about. Misogyny is over. Okay, I don't really think anyone actually believes that, but it's true that when I first got engaged at 22, I honestly didn't consider that marriage might impact me negatively in any way that it didn't my partner. After all, I was marrying a man who treated me equally. It was 2012. This was the stuff of the past, right? Mm, not that simple. All the data I could find on this topic collected data on what they term heterosexual marriages, because of course they couldn't be bothered to collect data on by people in mixed orientation, visibly heterosexual marriages, even though that would have been bloody illuminating. But here are some of the imperfect facts that I have. This study suggests that across Europe, husbands live an approximately 1.7 extra years. However, being married to a man knocks 1.4 years off your life, yikes. According to a Michigan study, husbands on average create an extra seven hours of housework a week for women. Single women recover better from heart attacks than married women, according to this Finnish study. And it is not having children, but being married that statistically holds women back in the workplace. Wow. In light of all that, should I be surprised that the word bride probably originated from the word broth or cook? Disappointed, but not surprised. Now, obviously you can't map large statistics onto individuals. And I don't believe that if I get married, I will automatically die young with less money from a heart attack. But it does mystify me that I didn't have more rigorous conversations about these things with my girlfriends during my 20s. How does this happen? How could we try and make sure that those numbers don't become us? Marriage has always been the same and always will be. Not at all. As we talked about at the beginning of the video, the introduction of love into marriage is something relatively new. Who is welcome into the marriage ceremony keeps fluctuating and depends on cultures. And there's now even things like sunset clauses which can extrapolate into sunset marriages in which couples decide to get married for the duration of 10 years and then either recommit or consider it a job well done and move on. So marriages and how we do them will probably continue to change. It would be naive to think that they won't. There's also the argument that marriage is kind of a semi-necessity in late stage capitalism. A pragmatic life raft against the unfairly rising tides. Tom Rasmussen floored me when they said this. <clears throat> Monogamy is a system which demands that we prioritize one other so that the state doesn't have to prioritize us. Monogamy 
and by and large marriage is a niftily constructed system which allows those in charge to neatly organise those that the state should care for. Marriage eases the state's responsibility to you. It means that when you get old, you'll have someone to care for you, or when you have a baby, there'll be people to take care of it. Thus we can work for each other, protect each other, nurse each other when we get old, all in our neat family units. And then we die and the state haven't had to do all that much to take care of its people. That's why non-monogamy is so frowned upon in the social sense. So call me a dreamer, but I'd like to see a society where everyone can afford to buy a house, raise children, be cared for in sickness and in health, and be loved and cherished, whether they end up with somebody or not. Ending up with somebody should be a full-blown, soppy as hell choice. And not ending up with somebody can be the result of preference, death, circumstance, or mostly just chance. Every single wedding I've been to has a by chance Genesis story shared in the toasts. And as somebody who has found someone who I don't hate, that I want to see every day and I want to have my mug collection when I die, I don't consider myself smart or savvy, just incredibly bloody lucky. Better late than never for us to come around. In conclusion, marriage has a checkered past, a present that excludes and exploits a lot of people, and a future that could be great, or at least better, if both married and unmarried people put their heads together and were honest about what works and what no longer sparks joy. If you are married, I would love to hear in the comments what your pros and cons list was when you were deciding. And if you're not married, would you ever consider it? Especially if you grew up in a different culture to mine, I'd love to hear some of the pluses and minuses of how you understand marriage. For me, marriage definitely remains an act of impressive optimism. And if you decide to do it after researching it, I completely support you. Also, please invite me to your wedding. I am an incredible wedding guest. And an even better, Hindu attendee. But marriage isn't something to be entered into lightly. And what I do know is that your 20s is often a time when your life is in complete flux. Being married to the right person at the right time can make that decade of your life even better. Being married to the wrong one can make it 1000 times worse. So I definitely think we need to have more open dialogue and education about marriage in your 20s. And I also wish that marriage wasn't so conflated with the rites of passage that we have in a lot of cultures and seen as an achievement rather than just what it is, a gift. And I wish that we as a culture made as big of a fuss about other milestones in our loved ones' lives. I don't want to deplete the fuss. I want more fuss. Redistribute the fuss. Spread the fuss around. Maybe one day I will either defeat or switch off all of these reservations in my head and do the deed, but it is not this day. 